This is going to be part two of Social Justice in the Gospel. The guys are going to discuss the response to the uh, original Social Justice in the Gospel statement that came out through Founders Ministries. And uh, we're going to talk about some other things. So it's going to be a great episode. Grab a coffee and enjoy. You're listening to the All Out War Podcast. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of All Out War. We are here bringing you to the intersection of faith, politics, and culture. I am Turner, and I'm so glad you're listening to us. This is episode number 10. We've made it to 10 episodes, Woo-hoo. guys. Woo-hoo. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. yeah. And I, with me in the studio is Rosie. What's up, Rosie? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Good. Hey, did you know that science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke was a pedophile? <laughs> If no, but, anyone doesn't know that he wrote a lot of books, including he co-authored, or he co-wrote the screenplay for 2001: A Space Odyssey. Oh, wow! Really? really? Yeah. yeah, he was absolutely. He liked. Uh, he liked moved kids to Sri Lanka, oh. Sri Lanka, however you pronounce it. Wow! And uh, was uh, was a pedophile. That's that's tragic. Yeah. A lot of these guys, when you look at some of their masterpiece pieces and uh, art. You kind of like second guess, like what's that guy's orientation? Yeah, I brought up about Peter Pan, uh, the author of the original. He was definitely a pedophile, mm. big time. Yeah. Oh, huge! I love how we start to show off on such a good note. Yeah. Uh, well. By the way, uh, you might recognize that voice. That's Cody. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> You're back, man. I come in, come out. Uh, it's come in, my come choice. Out. <laughs> Coming out. Uh-uh. Uh. Yeah. Wait. What? No. It's all a choice, bro. It's all a choice. <laughs> Dude, that's the perfect setup. That's the perfect setup. Speaking of choice, we are on part two of social justice and the gospel. And if you listened to episode number nine, we talked about uh, the statement that came out that was on social justice and the gospel. And and we can't, we found it through uh, Founders Ministries because they had it on a blog for them. But there was a statement on social justice and the gospel, and we talked about these things last week. Pretty pretty. It is over an hour we went over. There's 14 main points on that particular statement. It's a conservative, uh, it's a conservative evangelical worldview of these issues on the gospel, and they I mean, talk. It's the, it's, it's the correct worldview. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's biblical. Yeah, it's, yeah. Biblical. it's definitely biblical. But you're right in saying that it's focused, geared towards evangelicals. Yeah, and um, and then that what that did is when they released that statement, and if you if you want it, you can you can you can find it on uh, online and. Uh, anywhere but uh just just google founders ministries and then social justice in the gospel and and you can find it but what that did is that caused a an uproar of other groups to come out of the woodwork that were in disagreement with that and wanting to try and bring their statements as well and we talked about in particular a group that we were going to mention uh we mentioned it last week and we talked about it we were going to um just share what their statement was and and so this is the the counter of what we learned last week. And obviously you can say, well, if I, if I knew what you said last week, then what do I need to know what the counter is? But we want to, we want to kind of unpack it because there's thinking and, and there's a worldview behind this. And there's some things that are, that are more than it's just the opposite of what was said. And so we'll just go briefly on that in, in a minute. But, um, but this is a big, big topic and there's a lot of confusion for believers today in social justice. Uh, I think when I think about like our millennial generation right now, that um, probably a majority of people listening to this podcast right now are millennials. Uh, a lot of them have been um, fed from a very young age um, specific worldview, and a lot of that worldview is connected to this social justice aspect of our culture. And even more recently, in the last probably three years, I've just noticed that it's it's bearing more fruit. It's kind of like culminated. And there's a lot of confusion for Christians on how do I, how do I both love my friend, my neighbor, and but also not champion their their behavior that's like contrary to God's word that I do know is true, and it causes a dilemma. And it's literally nothing new. I mean, this is something the church has been dealing with from the beginning, right? Because they were plucked out of a worldly way and they're given a new way, the way. You know, that's actually what Christianity was called early on was the way, and. Um, and so they had to they had to grapple with these differences, and so it's not anything new, but for whatever reason, this generation 
is much more tenderhearted and they're more compassionate. And a lot of the social justice side of, of these things plays into that in a negative way. So, yeah, I mean, it comes back to the question, like, what is it? What do we mean when we say social? Like working definitions on both sides. Obviously, it's it's like public, but it's the things that people do together with our interactions with one another, our relationships. And so justice on that one point, I think on both sides there, someone needs to come in and just define what we're talking about when we say so for social justice so justice you know getting what you deserve your, your due yeah. in this sense like fairness equity equality and on that side no christian in their right thinking when reading the bible would ever say that they're against relationships that are not just and so in a nutshell like christians are for social justice if you put it in that bland of you know uh, of a of a setting but when you attach to it the um, formation and the ideologies that conspired to make the words come together in a political sense, you get something a little bit different than what the Bible is presenting. Mm. Yeah. Because you got to ask the question: Where did the where the, where did this buzzword come from? Yeah. And did they have any type of um, motivation to do something other than present? That's what I was kind of gospel? saying. Like it's been it's a generational thing. Like I think from for many many years our school systems have been kind of priming this mindset um, just with the way that they are grooming and the, the the way the education is and the things that they prioritize and the things that they classify as, you know, for important or not important and value. Um, I think those all play into this. Yeah. I was going to say to kind of go on to this, the, the, uh, the document that we're going to read, I was just looking at their about page. Um, so to go on, it says, uh, so the group that we're going to be reading is from the Progressive Asian American Christians. And it says, uh, it is an LBGT. Interesting that they only choose those four. There's no uh, plus sign? There's no plus sign. There's no A. There's no slashes. There's, there's no, no hetero. Yeah. So <laughs> it is an LGBT affirming feminist, justice oriented, anti racist, anti classist anti-ableist space that holds a wide range of theologies, which is interesting that it says that hmm. at the end, wide range of theologies. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they leave room so, maybe for somebody. Maybe. There's room at the table. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's who these people are. So, but here's the, here's the reason that one of the reasons that they get their voice is being recognized because one of the things we talked about was, sort of. well, <laughs> it's, I would. Well, maybe, it's recognized in circles that are not going to not going to follow the the original statement on the gospel and social justice, or you know th this is going to fall on liberal, non conservative, yeah. um, you know very progressive, um, you know church groups or church minds or not even Christian groups at all, but yeah. but allies in that camp, you know, and just like there's just like an evangelical world, there's there's conservative non Christian groups that are you know, kind towards churches and evangelicals, even though they wouldn't even identify as Christians, but they're because of a political uh, who they voted for or whatever, there's an ally there. Um, but so you'd find the same here. But, the, but what my point was is that because they're minorities, because we're talking about Pacific, Pacific Asians. So you have these, this Asian minority group. So whenever you have a minority and you're talking about social justice, the more uh, opportunities for offense to happen to you or oppression to happen to you, the greater your voice is recognized as one that has authority. And that's why I think a group like this would actually get more traction in an arena like the public right now with the whole idea of social justice. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, the oppression Olympics, whoever is the most oppressed. That's why everyone makes up right. all these things, like ableist. Yeah, the very, the very beginning of the social justice statement denies intersectionality like the very beginning that's the one that's more evangelical yeah when you well, guys define, talk about define intersectionality for someone that's listening because well i'm gonna people... just do it an example so you yeah. have a um a white woman who's in the workforce and you have comparatively another woman who's black lesbian and in the workforce the voice of amplification or morality or authority in intersectionality says to the one the one who has more layers or intersections on areas of oppression has the authority to speak more boldly or authoritatively um, in their areas of concern so you have two women but then you add race 
you know, workforce. So in there, the breakdown on intersectionality becomes, well, the woman is white, so she has privilege established through race. It's like you have to keep a scorecard. Exactly. So you're white, so that means you're, you have plus one uh, privilege points. And it, and, it's, and it works towards the idea of the there are real victims. Nobody's saying that they're not real victims. But the, it goes to the idea that you're in a culture where you're a minority, and so there is an oppressor, right? and you are a victim. And the amount of victim statuses that you can stack on top of each other, you start to intersect with spheres of life socially, and then you start to inter- interfere with what justice looks like in that. So social justice is written all over inter- intersectionality. Yeah. Where you come in and you're a lesbian, black worker, a uh, woman, you know, you're, you're maybe even trans. You're not sure. We're not sure. There, there are multiple components in there that, are, that make you uh, more authoritative to speak because you start saying that reproductive rights are essential to life. That's just what a typical mm. um, person with this ideology might have. And then you have someone who's a pastor. Let's just say. His name's Turner, and he just so happens to be a white male. He's Your straight. authority to speak to that is diminished, not because right. of truth, but right. because of who you are as a person right. and because, you're identifying. Because I haven't factors. gone through the, I haven't been through the the different difficulties of living that lifestyle or that way. Um, yeah, so I, I and actually I've oppressed people in that position is what they would because consider because you're white. Because I'm white. Yeah, just, but I'm not even trying to like that's easy. So, like I'm not trying it, to make it, but just seem like that's. No, that's that has actually, that's actually what's being no, done here. Like right, you no. cannot have a voice right. because you are part of a system and a your ancestors. Yeah, and then the, not on top of that, you're heterosexual. We didn't talk about that. Right. So you have intersectionality, middle, middle class too, in a privileged sense. Right. Yeah. And you're cis. Yeah, I have a cyst removed once from the doctor. <laughs> it was on my back. Does so that in, count? A, in a sense, no, if, if people want to get, a, that's kind of what we're talking this about. Is, the, so let me. Uh, I, I don't. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's fine. I, but. This is where I get nut. This is what drives me nuts because the terminology is they throw so many terms. Like you just said, cis. Like I, you know, most cisgender. Maybe more specific. Uh, yeah, uh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cisgendered. Whatever. But, Sorry, I'm a millennial, so I just throw out cis, cis. and assume that everyone knows. What everyone I mean. knows, right? But so you're talking about intersectionality, and it's basically a framework for power and marginalization. Yeah, or voice to say voice to power, voice yeah, but- to, voice to power and marginalize mar- people that are marginalized. So it's kind of like creating classes, or it's unifying classes, so that because there are the oppressors, there's unifying the oppressed. This is right. what when we were talking about before we were recording. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw introduced this concept, and it's a powerful concept if you mm. think about it. A woman who's been abused, who also has you know identity issues on multiple planes, mm-hmm. she might even in one point in her life be trans could be a man. Yeah, yeah. So you bring her, she's not able to you know, have mobility or agency in this culture because of heterosexual white, you know, male dominance in areas of, you know, access or privilege. And so you look at that and you're like that's a very po- that's a that's a powerful way to form a coalition of the oppressed. And that's the the poster child of the oppressed, right? It's like the more that the more victim cl- status right. claims you can play, that's it. You can the, play. That's the word victim. The more, which is the, like there are real victims. No, for I don't want to get caught up in the there are no victims, but no, there no. are real victims. There are victims. We're on but, record saying but, record saying that. So here's the: there are victims, and and there are it is it does happen. But let me ask you this question: If I make a decision to become a trans, like so, I'm I'm a man, but I want to become a woman. Um, am I in f- my decision, my freedom and my decision to make that decision? And I inflict, uh, you know, some sort of uh, discrimination against myself because of my decision. Do I really should I really be called a victim when that's what I actually made the decision to do? Well, no. Well, it's, I mean, we have to common you, sense, right? Well, here's the thing, which, which gets so tricky about all these things where you're talking about the definitions and all this stuff. Definitions don't matter. They make up stuff. They just make it up. Like, that's how you can have your own gender. Like, you can literally just say, like, this is, you know, I feel... That's how all these genders get made up, because someone looks at a definition, uh, a word, an actual word, like polyamorous or something, and now, oh, I'm a polysexual, because that that's not that's not even the one thing. I can't just say, I'm hetero, which, which I am. I'm heterosexual, because there's only two... I mean, okay, whatever. So, <laughs> I'm heterosexual. I'm not homosexual. But I, I don't 
further they're like that'd be making up a term for something i don't know like if oh i like blondes so now i'm a blonde sexual or you know like all that kind of stuff they just keep coming up with all these adjectives to describe themselves to try to build up more points um, and, and i was going to say the definitions don't matter and all of this like what you said about you want to become trans or something like that now you don't even have to I, go it, through the surgery that was an example i no, don't, no, no. don't want to become <laughs> no no i know, I know. <laughs> I'm just because kidding. you're not mentally we ill. don't want yeah. you to you're not <laughs> mentally ill so you don't want to become trans or you don't think you're trans I'm just saying it. it is. Um, but the whole thing is you don't actually like back in the day, if you were transsexual to be an actual transsexual, you like would go through the surgery and you would live your life as a woman or whatever, you know, like go well, through. Well, it used just to be cross-dressing when, when I was a kid, it was, you were a cross-dresser. Well, yeah. And I then mean, you were a transvestite, which was just basically a permanent cross-dresser, which means you didn't do both. You just, well, yeah, I don't think the opposite. I, gender. I think probably back then they're like, that's kind of far to actually go ahead and back then i'm not that old <laughs> <laughs> well, th we don't say tr transvestite anymore yeah, that's, that's why he said it like he did though that's why i said it like i did that was the term that was used no, 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 yeah when i was in you know elementary school or whatever in middle school that was the term yeah back in the 50s um oh, right you know, but anyways the, the point yeah. i'm just kidding the the point i'm saying you, is you millennial <laughs> that's a swagger <laughs> but, but anyway the whole point i'm trying to say is you don't actually have to do anything now you can just wear a woman's cut shirt and be consider yourself trans and go into any bathroom you, can, you want and you just say it yeah you yeah. don't need, and the other thing is you don't even have to wear you don't even have to dress like i don't have to i don't have to put on a dress to say that i'm trans i can just say that's how i'm feeling today man yeah i i think maybe with turner I, I catching me off guard here i agree with what you're saying but i think what we're interacting with is people who actually care about those words that is that is significantly different than um a person who doesn't understand how words work like there is logic behind this there's reason behind this they're applying a lot of emotion first they want justice they want what they believe to be true to be felt by all people whereas what you're talking about is like that's not just that's not true that's not in reality well, yeah yeah because I'm going not, to happen because like, i'm not sick but what turner <laughs> just, was trying to no, mention I know, I know. <laughs> What Turner's trying to mention is the just the idea of like how can you claim then victim status for something that you've chosen to walk into? Right, right, right. And our idea, I guess, we, maybe we get to some of the yeah, we, the we are going to get to that. <laughs> is that they really believe that there is a claim for their oppression, and they have identified in this statement a very, very defined oppressor. And this is classic. This is what people on the conservative end get charged with all the time like with now new buzzword or slang word is what we use two words cultural marxist or this is a marxist ideology yeah. when literally this stuff does come down to an ideology that's politically and economically based in socialism i mean just the fundamentals of the of what we're trying to argue now is classism right yeah, and exactly. you were talking about placing all these classes which i think that accurately um encapsulates what's happening is that they're throwing classifications, classes of people and valuing them based off of that rather than imago deo, right. which is we all have this equal status before God, but we as people don't value each other equally. And, you know, the, the rationality behind, you know, why these people feel oppressed is because there are actual things that we can point to where that would have to be terrible to be the minority group and, you know, to come out and say, where do I exist amongst the majority nor normal um you know functional culture so that's a valid concern the problem with all of that is what they're trying to speak power to is a um well it's the the, the justice comes at the silence of another yep. so what happens is they say well we're the oppressed you can't speak because you've been the oppressor and so they remove one person's freedoms for their freedoms, and then they call that justice. It, but what 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 is oftentimes not recognized is that their oppressions that they claim are, and this is what I was trying to get to. Some of them are self inflicted. Yeah. And some of them are made up. They're they're now. I'm not saying they don't exist because we already we already said that they do exist. And I, I have people that I care about that are in the homosexual lifestyle, and they've been made fun of and 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 persecuted and 
not persecuted. How, how, I'm not trying to discriminate it against um, many in many different ways throughout their lives. And it's painful to know that because um, as a person, they're a, they're a beautiful person. You know what I mean? And they're made in the image of God and, and, and they they have value. Um, and it's just sad that someone would treat another person that way. But, um, but there is a side of this that there's an agenda and there's a side of it mm-hmm. that they're trying to push through something. And so they make things worse or make it up. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's all made up. Okay. But when you read this, when we read right. this, you'll see the agenda component. So let's 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 start. Let's start because and and then it, as you're yeah. listening to this, as the podcast listeners are, are hearing this, what Cody just said is important. Listen to see if you can pick up on what might be an agenda. So th- at first they say uh, recognizing that we are called to seek just. This is the PAAC, the the Pan American uh, group, Progressive American Asian, Progressive, whatever it yeah, is. Progressive American Asian. Uh, it says, recognizing that we are called to seek justice, love kindness, walk humbly with the living God, we as Christians affirm God's commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves, Micah 6, 8, Matthew uh, twenty two thirty five. 35. I can't disagree with that. I think it's a great, nope. it's God's word. It's true. What we believe in the message of reconciliation as adopted by churches around the globe, that we are called to be peacemakers, salt of the earth, light of the world, we believe that God's will is for humankind to be reconciled to God, to God's self, and to each other. We believe that the actions of Jesus Christ were a reversal of oppressive systems, and that Christ provides us with a framework for undoing the harm they continue to cause today. Now, right, here's what I'm just yeah. saying: there's no gospel pronouncement in that first no. utterance at all. That this is where you would come out and you'd say, "This is the line that we're on." Well, and well, you would say you're on the line of what Jesus said that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Well, I, I, comes yeah, to the like, what, they don't have that. Well, here's what I was going to say though: is and, and I'm you know I'm not being picky here, but but what they're missing and what they're implying is what Christ's mission was to do, is, and they're missing that entirely because they say there that you know he uh, he und, undid the harm of this. He reversed oppressive systems. He didn't reverse an oppressive system. He literally established his system. It wasn't a reversal of anything, and he proclaimed to be God, which is going to be the final authority of everything. This is literally, by definition, what was in the early 19th century called the social gospel. Hmm. This is what was pronounced and proclaimed. This is the deviation that happens after social justice gets its foot in, is that Jesus Christ's atoning work is not individual it's collective and it's for oppressive systems. And I mean, this is like what you hear about when uh, you'll hear them say like, oh, well, God wasn't or Jesus wasn't hanging out with all the uh, the rich, the one percenters. He was hanging out with the prostitutes and all that stuff. So that like, right. they use stuff like this and they twist it and say, like, who are the oppressed people now? It's the gays and all this stuff, which isn't. Sure. And I'm not saying that to say that he doesn't love gay people or transsexual people or whatever it is. But I mean, that's where they, you can see where they're starting to twist it. Yeah. Well, also too, you know, I just, when I think about it, when you, what you just said about Jesus hanging out with the one percenters or whatever, he, he owns everything. He's God. It's like, there is no hanging out with one. And if anybody has one, a one percenter, it's because God gave them that anyways. It's his, it's not theirs anyways. So who he's going to hang out with. And we were all bankrupt. So spiritually, we were poor. Like you want to talk about, you know, oppressed. Spiritually, we were we were prisoners. We were poor. You know, when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the poor, right? And he wasn't talking about poor in the sense of physical reality. It's right. just your interpretation, man. No, man, because there's, there's you, you unpack the Greek and you know what it says. It's, there is no confusion to the words. And that's, words matter. And I think that's why this is really an important you know, why the first social justice in the gospel statement being made was so important. This response, it only it only kind of shows the cards of what, what we've kind it's of like, known for a while. But it's what I said before, before we were, it's like raid. You're spraying it into the dark area and you're trying to see like, all right, that which is supposed to be here won't flee. Right. And that which can, can you, you know, be called out from darkness will come to the light. You know, it's seriously putting a plumb line down. So if you read the rest of this, you're going to start to see not only are they pulling from old school, and this is key for those listeners. 
there's a difference between social justice and social gospel. Mm. Social gospel is easily identifiable. You can look at it. It's a 19th century kind of a phenomenon that happened, and it worked itself through a lot of churches. Did it come out of Europe? Came out of Europe, yeah, and it was a phenomenon that essentially that blew up in the evangelical church, or prior to the evangelical church. Sorry, it basically gave birth to fundamentalism, which basically said, "Wait, we which need to be more." To it, right? yeah. yeah, fundamentalism was a response to it. We need to be more word minded, and they were like, "No, we need to be work minded." The word got us here. Now we have to finish the the work, and the work is pretty much what you just read there. It is um, redeeming culture, redeeming oppressive systems not individuals that's a secondary thing yeah. jesus started it and now we'll it's, finish it's it systems yeah yeah so the second one that they say it says we believe that the pursuit of social justice is essential to a life of faith in jesus and is a present day calling of the church the credibility of reconciliation is obstructed when christian communities proclaim it in a way that perpetuates and separate the separation of its members in this document, we specifically name the discrimination name discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexuality, and class as perpetuating alienation and enmity to God and between members of humankind. So let's stop there for just a minute. I do want to say there that it says uh, it says uh, the credibility of reconciliation is obstructed when Christian communities proclaim it in a way that perpetuate, perpetuates a separation of its members. So uh, this is important. What what identifies you as a member of the body of Christ? What is gonna What is gonna classify an individual as a member of the body of Christ? Right. Well, it comes through the confession that they that they not only know that they're sinners, but they believe in the Savior. Right. And that the act of loving one another is a marker for all the world to see that right. we love one another. This will show the world that our faith is not just in our family, but it's in the strangers that came along and identified themselves as sinners and beggars who needed the Savior as well. Those are two components that that identifies the church to the lost world, is that we believe in Christ to the point where we will forsake family if the family that we came from does not love Christ. We now have a new family and we love the church. Those are two markers that I think that uh, distinctively put the gospel on display is that it's individuals choosing Christ, individuals choosing to love the church. Right. And uh, you probably further expound on that, but the uh, the idea that they miss from the very beginning is that they don't believe in individual salvation. Mm -hmm. They believe it's a foundation to start things. It's almost like a universal already already achieved but but paul said in corinthians i was just looking for but he said he talks about he actually specifically names homosexuality he talks about shouldn't be acting in this way in this way in this way and he says he he and he says homosexuality and thieves and drunkards and all these things and he says as some of you were, yeah, were. right so he indicates that those that are being saved that become members they actually had a lifestyle that was contrary to the word of god wait a minute are you going to go ahead and say that the early church addressed a lot of these issues? <laughs> Buddy, let me tell you, they there's <laughs> nothing, not an issue nothing new under the sun, man. Money, every point of this. Race, yeah. money, sexuality, you know, like we're talking about even no, slavery no. And, and owners and things of that nature. No, I know. I'm just playing. Yeah, no, I love that. That's though. exactly what you hear right now is. The most relevant document or statement on this is the Bible. Right. <laughs> right. And but it's I mean, the most tried as well. It's been the most hammered out and resisted. But I mean, that's one of these things that you hear about that these li liberal progressives um, say is, well, Jesus didn't specifically talk about, uh, he did not come out and say, it is wrong to be homosexual. In like those, they want it in the English. They want it, it would probably, they would prefer it if it's like, yo, it's cool if you're like gay or stuff. Like, you know, they want, because I'm just translating it for like what, a millennial would want to hear oh, okay like a pat on the back and yeah, because yeah, yeah. jesus doesn't specifically say that then we well, don't they know where the read, Bible, there they, is red letters right we want to talk on red letters <laughs> there's red letters in revelation they got to go look in there because there's a mention that he yeah but you're there. you're assuming still that these guys are even opening the bible no but people I mean, always say jesus never said man i'm like hey revelation he speaks there's red letters in that part too well the, the bible. And speak to that, he never said. He Not only did he say he inspired the whole thing. Right, you know? right. I mean, the spirit of Christ <laughs> is going through Leviticus. Right. Like, he's talking about the abomination. He came up with that word. Right. And he I put mean, it in its context so that yeah. his people would be pure. 
I'm just trying to play. I know the, the devil's at it, it. guys. <laughs> it's a war, man. We're in a war, right? But that's an right. easy. I look be, no. be charitable. Yeah, you want to be charitable to those that claim that they're 100%. representing Christ, yeah. right? But right. when you go through this document, you're like, they don't even like. They don't. Understand. They don't even like. They don't have the gospel right. So if you're coming at a position saying that your 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 literal website is this statement on God's justice, and you deny the gospel, the most clear defined. Uh, revealed justice from God was that he punished his son. Yeah. He he placed yeah, wrath that's, that's on him the and he, he gave, yeah. Talk about not deserving, mm-hmm. right? And they, in the jump, they said the foundation of that sets us apart. Right. And it's like, what do you mean the foundation? Like it is the whole thing. Jesus right. is everything for the individual. And they, no, for systems. Yeah. They're like, I'm engaging now, but you don't know what you're talking about, which is this, let's go further down. And you'll start to see that. So let's move on a little <laughs> a little bit more. So they go into bi- the Bible. Now we're starting the crazy stuff. This is the well, crazy biblical stuff. inerrancy. Yeah. They, you know, we no, would believe that. But bibi- what's, biblical what's, errancy. So what's not biblical inerrancy. In, what's biblical inerrancy? Inerrancy is it's accurate. It's 100% right. But biblical errancy means that there's room for mistake. That's what they're, that's what they proclaim here. It says. Which, well, hold on before you go, which goes back to what he was saying about. It, he never spoke on it. He never right. said it. It's right. because the inspiration of it, the errancy or the inerrancy. Well, let's read the let's read it first before you get it, because you got a lot to say there. I can tell. So let's read <laughs> read. The, our listeners don't know what they wrote. So let's what they wrote was we affirm the centrality of the holy scriptures in our lives. They call them holy, at least at least that's good. It's a lowercase on mine. Yeah, yeah mine yeah. too. The holy scriptures in our lives as as Christians called by scripture to mission in the world. It is inspired by God and handed from community to community through the ages as a living document, um, a living God through the written word, the word is living, uh, the written word, uh, commands us to love God and our neighbors, which includes combating injustices such as racism, xenophobia, sexism, misogyny, ableism, transphobia, and homophobia. What is ableism? Can someone help me out with that? So that means like if uh, you're a disabled Okay. So if you're disabled, you get privilege points because you're disabled. Like so, an able-bodied person. Able-bodied person. Okay, so, gotcha. Um, can I, I just wanted to, I wanted to say something about the living document because I hate when, and, and I agree with, with, with what you said about the, the word of God is living. Yeah. But the way that they mean it here is yes. the same way that they mean that the Constitution is yep. a living document. Right. Which that means that it can change. Be changed. And this is an important thing. When again, getting down to words, when they say a living document, they don't mean it the same way that we do. That that the Bible refers to itself. They don't mean that. They mean that this can be updated, this can be changed, it can be reinterpreted using modern frameworks. And basically, I'll just to riff on this for a little just yeah. a second about when they talk about the Constitution and just to pick an easy one, the Second Amendment, when they'll say the founders could not have envisioned the the kind of war machines that were that you know every twelve year old is going to be able to get, and they're all going to mow down everyone in their school. Um, the founders, if they knew that what we were capable of creating, they never would have used that. So right because they don't know what they what they intended, and because we're so much smarter than they were, and we're going to reinterpret their words to show what they really mean. Right. Um, and they have to it's, they have to revise history and do all kinds of stuff to right. to get to that point. And I mean, so that's that's what they're trying to. That's what it's little word twist. They mean that we're it's living and is able to change because that's what because they believe in this like evolution, you know. So yeah. yeah, over time, if it continues living, it changes because a person, you know, you take a person when they live longer, <laughs> they change. You know, yeah. you grow up, you learn new things, you go to school, you get educated. Your views might change, the way you view the world changes. So they, that's what they mean when they say. Yeah, well, an interesting about. point. I don't even read the rest of it. Sorry. Um, I'm, it's just, just read the rest of it. I got too many thoughts. <laughs> All right. So, so they say that. Uh, so they go on to say that the living God, the living God through the living through the written word, commands us to love our neighbors and and God. And this in, this includes combating injustices that would include racism, xenophobia, sexism, misogyny, ableism, transphobia, and homophobia. Uh, they forgot to mention people that are have receding hairlines. Or uh, no or, hair. Or no hair, yeah. <laughs> Baldism. Um, 
Yeah, baldism. So it says, then they go on to say, we affirm that the fundamental truth of the Christian faith is whether we live or whether we die, we are gods. And uh, they quote uh, scripture out of Romans 14, 8. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. We are still in our sins. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 15, 17. Then they go on to say, we affirm that Scripture proclaims without error the resurrection of the risen, sa- risen Savior, the salvation gained in the character of God, whose gracious love, unending mercy, and infinite compassion are the foundation of our salvation and ongoing expansion of the kingdom of heaven. There you go. So um, then they say, we affirm that Scripture proclaims without error that the law and the, all the prophets are subject to to the foremost priorities of loving God and loving our neighbors. Uh, And then we affirm biblical inerrancy is theologically untenable. This is the one that killed me. Uh, And becomes a moral evil when it allows Scripture to be weaponized against women, people of color, LGBTQIA plus symbol, individuals, and people of other faiths. How'd you like? I nailed that with all those letters. That was pretty good. Yeah. We're going to have to email them and tell them to update the original one because... There's more letters. Yeah. They only had LGBTQIA. At the beginning. At the beginning. Yeah. So that's the one that really gets me. Yeah. Because it says that that biblical inerrancy is theologically untenable. Well, they get in the front door as the... Like, they they want the conversation because they they believe... They say it, at least in these words, that we have... We have the need to to be gods. Yeah, we are. We live and die, and we are gods. We have the need for um, it says Christ's resurre- resurrection. They 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 heard that one in the scriptures. If you don't have that, you don't have the whole faith. So right. they got that, and they go down. And they say the foundation of salvation is through Christ. You know, death. They, they got that one. So they got the seat at the table. Remember earlier you said there was a big table we all sit at. Yeah, we got the, the, the they got the tables aligned. When they come down to the aspect where. You start talking about the living document component mm-hmm. that starts to be reinterpreted. It's like they they affirm against they affirm the positive this the idea of you can't have biblical inerrancy because when you start reading the specifics on what the culture said in a certain time and place, then you co sign that back. To that's what God said. He does say certain things right. universally forever. Yeah, and He is not changing. So that's why they can't hold the biblical inerrancy because God said a lot of things about a lot of people groups and a lot of, well, not a lot of people groups, a lot of um, roles that we play, yeah. lifestyles. Cultures. Like marriage being between one man and yeah, one Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. And so, no, I was, no, that's exactly right. Thanks. And so they can't allow biblical inerrancy because God spoke on a lot of issues that they now are now in a category of being oppressed when... Well, now and also too, it's like if you don't believe. So this is the this is the kicker for me. If you don't believe that that the scripture is reliable because for certain reasons, then how can you trust in that Jesus is the only way? Because the scriptures proclaim so they that don't Jesus want to be called is, heretics, right? But but, but well, Does, I told you I mean, earlier I mean, that's, that's the easy one, one. One side of it, yeah. But my point is, is that you're going to tell me on one side that Jesus is the only way, but on the other side, you're going to say, but the Bible's not reliable. Well, how did I know that? I don't, I've never met the man. I mean, I know him through his Holy Spirit right now, but I'm telling you, this is a slippery slope. And self-correcting algorithm. Yeah. It knows what to take as this truths, is, as truisms. Yeah. It knows how to survive in a functional evangelical world. Because to deny any of those, you're not get the, you're not having a table. It's they, like a they Judas. Get the it's like a Judas with the twelve man. It's just sitting in the group the whole time, following along. But all and all along, it's got to. Mm-hmm. And see, that's why it's so important to like. I think read read this stuff and yeah, like say fine. it is because there is enough that they. It, it, this is like the more, the more that we're reading this, the more that we're talking about it. it. This is like purely evil. This is satanic. I mean, this is what right. they use and they twist it because they know just enough. Like you said, enough boxes to tick that we right. go. All right, you're on our keep, side. Keep people off and of their then back. You just yeah. throw in some stuff, and if you don't, and it, it's really, I mean, this stuff is so. We're trying, we're because no one can see us. We're really trying hard not to laugh when we're reading some of this stuff because this it next is one. so. The next, well, the next reject, the, Steve. <laughs> cause, cause take a the, breath. The, the, I, take take a sip of your Coke yeah. Zero. I want to respect know. the people that they probably put some effort in this. There's a they lot did. of. I mean, lot of stuff so we should probably here. say that we still love these people and believe that they. Well, I want are, them to come to true faith in Christ. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
I well, want the worst them to part know. Is that some of them may may have true faith in Christ, but sure. their conviction is so like crippled, yeah, because of what they either identify as or what has been told to them that they must identify as. So yeah. they're they're playing in because this is well read. There's a lot of innocent well, people too that that get pulled into this, you know, uh, without without having discernment. And, then, and so the conviction component on this is that the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of, you know sin and righteousness for mm-hmm. judgment's sake mm-hmm. for the sake of judgment and so they just basically said we can't believe in inerrancy because it's a moral well, evil re- listen to the last one though yeah. that they reject because this is this is important yep. it says we reject the use of scripture which has passed through generations of imperfect human hands to marginalize other children of god period okay yeah period but god is unchanged and perfect so as flawed beings, we seek to emulate God's character, perfect justice, and grace. That doesn't... Um, so, but here's the problem. So they're saying that so they want it both ways, yeah. and that's really what this is boiling down to. They want it both ways. They want both. They want heaven, but they don't want the lordship of God and the rule of His kingdom in their in what in this area of their life. I mean, this because God has statements on these things. Right. It's almost like one of those things that is very common, um, especially among men or women too. I mean, once you hear it, I mean, this is obviously a problem with women too, but I'll just say it. So you hear guys when they're like, oh, okay, I know I'm saved. I- I'm saved, right? Because once you're saved, you're always saved. And that's another thing. But um, well, just going from that basis, which is we, I believe we that. all agree on. Yeah. Um, so well, you I believe can- Paul. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but okay, okay. So common thing will be like, well, I'm not having sex with my girlfriend, mm-hmm. um, or maybe you are, or you're looking at pornography, but but it's not sex, so I'm not bringing that commandment, or you know, I'm not lusting. You know what I mean? Like you use these rationalizations, it's because the world is seeping into it, and that's like the lens that they kind of give themselves a pass. Well, I'm not committing adultery because, or you know, they'll try to say something like it's not as bad as sleeping with a girl. So pornography and, and at the bottom line, because I'm saved, I can always just ask for forgiveness yeah. and I'm a stumbled, I'm an imperfect human being. So it's like that kind of thing, that rationale of thinking, well, I can always ask for God's forgiveness. I'll never be able to lose that. I can't do anything to. It's called sloppy grace. <laughs> it's yeah, right. it's, it's abusing the, it's abusing the grace of God. Right, right, right. But I want to just say in this statement where it says that, which the the use of they reject the use of scripture which yeah. has passed through generations of imperfect human hands it, you know the one thing about script that, that's an implication that scripture has been modified for purposes that would put to, people marginalize to, to people, marginalize right? other children of god that's but but what they don't realize is that we have reliable copies that go back. if you just do a historic evidence of the reliability of scripture it's unchanged it's been unchanged and like in the in in particular, the Old Testament is they took, I mean, the requirements for scribes and those that were the Masoretes who were copying the text, the 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 requirements and the way that they even had to do it was so stringent that the the amount of error was minimal. And they they but the fact that God's hand is on it, and when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, we, all of that was confirmed. A lot of these progressive mindsets on scripture being living and changed over over centuries or whatever because of people that had been handling it, when the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls were found, all of that was proven wrong and thrown out the window because they had copies that were really old and reliable and accurate. Yeah. And we found out that, wow, we're not really far off from our, our original text. Right. One thing I'll, I'll say to... That's true. I think the manuscripts yeah. just there's no other document out there that you can come close to. Right. Even Shakespeare. This is easy. I mean, I mean this yeah. is stuff that um, Socrates. <laughs> Socrates. Socrates. <laughs> uh, the original documents like they pale. Like the Bible has so much more. Yeah. But uh, again, going back to what we were trying to say about there are real victims. Do you guys? Did you guys go to the Bible Museum in DC? Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, been there. So they have something called the Slave Bible that's on display, and it's. It's a slave owner, owner's Bible that he took out the passages where God for liberated, yeah. you know, people in their slavery, and yeah. all the passages where it talks about the liberation, how you have a year of release. So, in that one sense, you can say, okay, there's truth to the statement that men, if it's traveled through our hands, that we can manipulate it. 
So they affirm something that's accurate and you can document it. But I'm saying right here is manipulation of God's word in their statement. Right. Because they're doing exactly the same thing that they're indicting other fallen yeah. men that are doing. So, uh, and the, well, one last point yeah. here is that the fact that there are people who have manipulated and used the word of God to do malicious and terrible things towards, quote, your group is horrible. And we reject that. The Bible says to treat all people equally according to their, you know, imago Deo. Like we're supposed to have that worldview that comes from the Bible that establishes value onto people. Like we yeah. don't look, we, we are not able as Christians to look down on somebody because we're all broken equally. Right. What this does is it basically says, if you have a view that's so high of the scripture where you're actually quoting it literally on areas of, um, you know, <laughs> class or whatever category, then you're actually unbiblical. Right. That. Dude, that you gotta see it's the called, illogical. It's called the messenger. It's like killing the messenger. Well, you know? that's what I was gonna well, say. I was gonna say one last thing is yeah. that that right there shows me that they're not for the gospel. They're not for what Jesus has to say. They're more politically minded. They're right. very much going to attack for the rest of this statement something that is pretty much antithetical to um, any any person who's interacted with Jesus and what his mission was. I think we're gonna see that when you start reading more about yeah. that. But um, Stephen, you had something you want to say. Sorry. No, I was just going to say the thing what you said about the slave owner's Bible or Thomas Jefferson's Bible where he took out all the right. supernatural a deist. things. Right, right. A, exactly. A deist. Um, so it's important that when they when we affirm that people have changed the Bible in certain ways, we are not saying like we're not saying that Thomas Jefferson's Bible got spread and now that is exactly. the Bible that we are using. That is like an instant. Well, that's what my, I don't that's my whole point on, of the copies. We right, have right. we have copies mm-hmm. to verify and to compare right. to uh, keep it accurate. Right. I'm trying to. Right. Yeah, yeah. So when they not, would point to the one and that overrides the total. Right. Like right. That right. one well, incident one validates did our. It. Yeah. Well, uh, horribly, how many people did that? How many Lots people? Of people. You know what I mean? That's injuries. horrible. Yeah. You, you need to isolate that. That's that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. But speaking to your point is that we as Christians in this century can look back and say, no, nah, not only is that wrong, but it was really wrong because previous generations never had done that. So even though, I mean, there are, there were old sex and Gnostics. There were, there was right, other yeah. people that groups back in twisting the scriptures, twisting the yeah. scripture. Exactly. Back in the day when scripture was being, this written is, this stuff. is essentially why Paul said, you know, I brought to you, what I brought to you, you build, you know, you're building on a foundation that doesn't going to change. It's right. about building on the foundation of the gospel of Christ. And, you know, he says, I, and what I gave to you was first and foremost of the most importance, you know, and, and then you have these groups that come in and they try and, they try and change it. They, they try and fit it well to their benefit. It's a living document because we're a living community and we evolve. <laughs> and so therefore, whatever the word has spoken on definitively in one season, it's subject to change. They're yeah. not outright saying that, but they're saying that. Yeah, that's what they're saying. Yeah. yeah. They're saying it. We can we can we can twist this enough to fit our which our, means our agenda. The personal salvation which Jesus died for on the cross for all the world, for all those that would believe, every single person that Christ saw as the potential uh, believers in Christ, they're saying maybe. Right. Let's give some time. Let's see how this works in ten or fifteen years. Yeah, they're not right. outright saying that, but to the point you you can see right through it. It's like they're well, not the, even. But the but the, th- the other thing too is this: is that when you talk about like some of the things that they are saying, like for instance, when they talk about, um, hold on, I just want to go back. I have to scroll back up here on my on my iPad. They're talking about um, trans transphobia, homophobia, sex, misogyny, ableism, xenophobia, racism. You know these type of things when you read in God's word, I mean, th- this is because of the gospel, Paul could appeal to Philemon's uh, owner to let him, let him be set free, you mm-hmm. know? Um, Cause he was a slave, right? Don't, don't say that. Don't contradict the, the uh, Asians, well, the Asian no. uh, PAAC, the progressive Asian Americans. Yeah. Well, but, but no, that's because of the gospel in a culture where slavery was not, was happening. And it was, it was a, approved of and it was in all parts on all areas uh, in different levels some good some bad but because the gospel he could appeal to him say hey you can set that guy free 
this guy could be set free, you know, and or keep, give him his freedom. Which you know? I'd said to something like this, and I don't mean it to be too offensive, although it will sound offensive. If Jesus is your model for the social justice warrior, then he was a really bad social justice oh, yeah. warrior. Yeah. yeah. So was Paul. These are people who articulated in word to submit, to give to Caesar what is due to him. Yes, it's monetary, but Paul said that the governing authorities were placed there from God to distribute authority and justice against evildoers. Right. Whoa. And then he ended up having his head cut off while he was in Rome by the ruling powers that be. Right, right. Clearly there's injustice in that, but these are not the people that you're looking for. Yeah. If you're looking for the example archetype well, of well, what a social justice warrior looks like, because these guys literally died for the cross. Early Christians, right? They faced all kinds, all kinds, just because the, of what they believed mm -hmm. and what they were living out. Not hurting anyone, serving other people. They were actually a they were actually a benefit to a culture and society because of of how they were helping and serving and feeding the poor. And, and so, but yet they're being killed and persecuted for their beliefs for what they believed right yeah and i mean to so, say the social justice in the aspect of what we're about to get into yeah because, not, you know, i don't want to compare social either. functioning and how we yeah. distribute right things that are due to one another yeah yeah like that's not what i meant when i mean yeah. i'm kind of poking fun at the fact that the social justice topic that we're talking about has literally has seems like has two jesus's yeah. You have the Jesus of the Bible who came to die for our sins. And then socialist Jesus and then you to <laughs> sell his, that's what that's what they believe. He came to distribute his righteousness for systems to be more functional. But wait, wait, I'm gonna go back to a point that you said that I'm pretty triggered over here. <laughs> so you're meaning you're that God allowed Donald mm -hmm. Trump to become president. I believe so Yeah. So much in the sovereignty of God that even despots <laughs> that rise to power, God has his, not only his control over, but his purpose. To the point where he that. allowed his son to come into a nation which was under the oppression of a ruling nation. Right. And in that, there was they were proxy. Already oppressed. Yeah. Yeah. There was proxy leadership that was coming through this, like the ruling councils of a religious group that God never appointed. It was like Laird. <laughs> it was had, intersectionality. You, but, but think about it. You had the Romans, and then you had the ruling religious class that was <laughs> that was against them too. You know, like the Pharisees and Sadducees. You know. And, and then, you, well, this is a good point. Then you get this Jesus who shows up, who does no crime wrong at all. Right, right. He doesn't even break the Sabbath because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Right. Like he doesn't do anything Although wrong. Although they accused him. They accused him many times, many, many times. And so yeah. what are they? He gets this. Um, but they were just accusations. He get They get the trial and he gets through it and he doesn't say a thing. And right. even even uh, Pontius Pilate washes his hands of it because he sees the injustice of what's happening. Yeah. And Jesus proclaims, like, if I wanted to change this, I'd send my And angels. who did they ask for? Bar Jesus. Give us Barabbas. Or Barabbas, I'm sorry. Yeah. B Barabbas. Which yeah. means. Um, in, 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 insurrector. Yeah. Who's the insurrector? But you I mean. you see that like, all the opportunities Rebel. for him to basically say, "Rise up for my people, liberation." Actually, they killed him because he was so weak. Like yeah. this isn't the one. Remember when there's the the accusation that said that there was somebody that came through and it was bad for us. This could this could be the same thing. Like he's oh, going to take our place. Yeah, you're talking about uh, when uh, after after he had already died. And, yeah, and there's a passage in like, Acts he'll four. Die. He'll, if, if it's if it's nothing, it'll die. But it, you know, if if it was something, then it's of God. We can't stop it anyways. That was uh, that was Paul's that was Paul's Pharisee who he was learning under Gamaliel. Yeah, Gamaliel. Yeah. The last point on that was that he said that in uh, Acts four, he says that this was all predestined by God in the sense that God has not only his governing hand on all things. But to essentially assign back to God any type of indictment for your victim mm -hmm. status that you're claiming, you're, so you're basically saying, I'm being defined by other people's sins against me. Whereas when Jesus dies on the cross, and yeah. we're not Jesus, but he's defined by his righteousness that he applies to the sinners who he died in their place. Yeah. He took the victim status, yeah. but he had the righteousness in God, which you know took the justice of God to... Um, Right, you know, finalize. Well, the, the only work. reason the victim status was there is because he truly was holy. Yeah, right. And, but and he is the so, only one who can claim that. Right, right. only ever. He's the yeah. only true victim that has ever lived, and Ooh. and he lives evermore. All right, so it's, let me. Let's, uh, yeah, we're let's getting we're getting deep on some other stuff, but so they go on. So they they talk about God's word and <laughs> biblical. And, Get to this next answer. one, Turner. But I'm gonna. There's others. But hold on. So they have they these, these are the topics: anti-imperialism, which we're gonna mm -hmm. talk about, gender equality. Uh, racial equality, sexuality and gender identity, 
economic equality and a refutation on the statement of so so they do they refute uh the one that we read last week so um let's yeah. let's go back to uh this one that cody's so eager to talk about uh and that is anti-imperialism i mean that's a phrase i haven't heard in a long time man like uh that's uh imperialism i remember that in like ninth grade history class well if you want to we have some imperialism going on right now just going to go ahead throw this out we can talk about it later but uh keep your eye on china and africa mm-hmm. and all the stuff that they're doing so it is not totally out of the table but that is sure. a complete side note um on everything but i just thought i'd throw that out there mm-hmm. all right anti-imperialism we affirm that colonialism and empire are forms of domination, violence, and control that run contrary to the teachings of Jesus. The gospel was born in Roman-occupied Judea in Galilee region, where Jesus lived as an imperial subject among a conquered people, threatening the the ideological foundations of the Roman Empire. Jesus said, blessed are the poor. Oh, man, they're using my own words. Hold on. Uh, (laughs) Blessed are the poor as he challenged those with power and wealth to forfeit their possessions told you socialist jesus is right here that's right that's right uh as god delivered the israelites out of pharaoh's rule in exodus narrative protected daniel and his friends from the violent rule of king nebuchadnezzar and the babylonian empire in the book of daniel and cast judgment on emperor nero and the roman empire in their persecution of the early christians in the revelation of john we understand that God does not stand with the conquerors, but the conquered. So let me just, one thing here. They said the Exodus, Exodus narrative, right? So yeah. we're not even sure if they believe it's a real text or right, a story. Right, right, right. <laughs> goes through and they place the judgment, not to the people of Israel, but to Nebuchadnezzar. And you go down further, the judgment goes to Emperor Nero, not to the people of Israel uh, or the early Christian Jews. And then the last one, they basically affirm that they're preterists. They believe the book of Revelation already took place and happened in 70 AD. And it didn't just happen against all those that are ungodly. It happened against Nero. Mm-hmm. If you see a theme here, the judgment from God isn't against sinners or the rebels that are you know, uh, in Israel or early Christian Jews who are underneath the oppression. Well, it's against it's <laughs> Nero's name isn't even mentioned in the book of Revelation. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. They're showing their hand. Right. Right. They're, they're basically saying all judgment that comes from God is against systems. Right. Only them. Do you see that? Yeah. <laughs> that's insane. That's your, I know. your statement is like God's a, only really upset with governments. Yeah. Right. It's so like that's why we should hate Donald Trump. Just saying, that's what they're. That's what they're I'm saying they start to show their cards here. But sorry, yeah. go ahead. Your turn. So uh, they affirm anti-imperialism, anti-imperial sentiments of the early Christians, <laughs> who called Jesus Lord, uh, a politically loaded term that was typically reserved for Caesar or in, God. In spite of, <laughs> I, I know, I'm getting right? <laughs> in spite of Roman persecution, the early church flourished underground. The willingness of early Christians to die for their faith inspired others to take up the cross. Well, uh, they'll move on. Like they, they, uh, they're basically saying the only reasons that Christian ident- identified the word Lord to uh, Jesus was because Caesar was Lord. Right. Well, the only way that Caesar was saying that he was Lord is because he was Lord of o- Lord yeah. over of all of a the system. other lower right. forms of gods and systems. That's right. He was a system. Yeah. But God had already revealed Himself in the quote unquote narrative of the Old Testament to be Lord. Oh yeah. Dude. So when you claim that Jesus is Lord in your New Testament, you know, you're in the well, New Covenant era. You're basically saying that Jesus, the the one who came in the flesh, is Adonai. Like he is the Lord. Mm-hmm. He has both rule over my life because I've submitted myself to him, but he also has rule over dominion in the whole world. And yeah, this we're, is we're the, not debating that. Uh, I'm just saying, like, table, these, but, these is, you're showing yeah. your hands when you read yeah. this. I mean, this is but, like someone, I mean, using a word. I'm trying to think of like a good example of like now where, um, like say Jesus uh, or in the past they were saying that uh, you know Jesus was going to come and he's going to use the term president, and all of a sudden oh well we call someone else president. So by calling Jesus president, we're sticking it to him. Yeah, but Lord is used all over history. I mean you know if yeah, you, if just... you were a, if you if you owned land and you were a, you know you had right right, the, right. They, they were considered they still like, use the term lord and you rented in, yeah land. you rented out property or whatever to other families for farm or whatever they'd call you the lord of the land or whatever but there's but what they're saying is because they're calling him the, the term that was given to him before right. and because humans had 
before Jesus was born, they were using that term on the earth, that because they were using it, that was like a big sticking it to the man. And, oh, it, and, it, yeah. and that's and they're talking about the anti-imperialist. Yeah, so that's, that's the point that they're trying to make. This they're is not a political a statement. theological statement. They're making a, a politi- political yeah. statement. And they're right. now, now they're saying like we actually infer our political narrative and ideology from the early Christians. Right. So they're getting closer and closer to the origins of Christianity, which is they're more biblical. Right. Well, they don't even. Believe we identify with we all identify right. with the apostles, but we're not going to believe anything that they say right, right. or anything that they <laughs> how they live their life. But we're victims too because someone gave us a weird stare. All right, we I'm decry. Sorry. They decry. So they affirmed, and then now they decry. Oh, man, uh, if it if it wasn't so sad, it would be funny. I'm, it's funny no, it's pretty sad. It's sad. Because when sad. you read this, they're fig- lost they're- people, man. And it says, we decry the collusion of Christian faith leaders with state power, <sighs> which began during the time of the Emperor Constantine and continues today. Boom. Uh, in North America, early European settlers who, who stole native lands and launched the African slave trade. Uh, Muslims? Um, uh, sorry. The African trade slave did so in the name of Christ. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> that's a convenient yeah, J- Jamestown in 1619 that that was all Christians yeah yeah I mean no Jesus wept no. it says Jesus wept the colonial legacy continues and we call on all Christians to work to end all forms of racism white supremacy exploitation and forced assimilation during the last century US military action and economic policy has spread U.S. power throughout the globe at the expense of many of the world's people. As the world's leading superpower today, the United States holds a position similar to that of Rome during the ancient times. We call on Christians to advocate for the victims of U.S. imperialism by working for demilitarization and peace. I I wonder if they're pro-Second Amendment. (laughs) I I can't. When I read this the first time, I literally was like, this... Forced assimilation. The leaps that they're making here are unbelievable. Okay. They went to like Jesus' Lord to the United States needs to dis- right. <laughs> disarm. Demilitarize our country. What is this talk? Like, I, <laughs> it just like goes off the rails. As someone who studied- This is what happens when you get so focused on your victim cause that you totally miss the biblical yeah. issue. You know, you throw around the word like gospel issue all, of, all the time. You hear that. This is a gospel issue. Now, like- the U.S. being dismantled and taken out of as a present power is a gospel issue. That's I, thanks. So uh, uh, history too is important when it talks about Constantine, uh, the Roman Empire. Like I knew they were going to go there. By the way, when I was reading it, um, it said the collusion of Christian faith leaders and state power, which began during the time of Emperor Constantine and continues today. Um, Constant Constantine. If you know history, he put the cross on because Which they don't. They they don't, right. They <laughs> won. they have an issue with history. There were some battles that were won and some Christians were forced to fight because they were actually put into the military through a slavery act from the Roman Empire and they prayed for God to give them victory. They didn't want to die. And they won. And Constantine was like, well, these Christians have something that we need to continue to win in military prowess. And so part of it was he started putting the cross on their flags and their shields and and the Roman Empire had this interesting, uh, bizarre connection with Christianity in that way, uh, and then he and then he allowed it to be freely, you know, exercised in the in the empire eventually. Um, so historically, it wasn't like Christians were like, okay, we need to go and we need to make friends with Constantine and we need to get in power. Like it was some kind of power thing. That- like today, there's the equivalent to that of a Russell Moore who will sit in the Oval Office with Obama right. and like sit with him, knowing that a lot of his policies are antithetical to Christian thought and belief. Sure. And then, or Billy Graham when he used to meet with presidents. Well, I'm hitting on Russell Moore because that's a more easy one for us to see because the clear identifying thing for a Christian when you see that, okay, yeah, get someone in the Oval Office. Like, please encourage him to go like yeah to uh, more of a biblical to plead our case and yeah, yeah because like we, why we, we're stoked about having Pence. Exactly, yeah, yeah. but then you have Russell Moore, who as well takes the complete opposite for many, many reasons, and says that Trump's so immoral, such a terrible character, 
can't even sit in the Oval Office with him. I don't even want to be the person that influences him to the point that I believe that there is sovereignty over him being in the office. However, I'm going to do all that I can to work against him from the outside. Whereas he was so willing to sit down with the Caesar of our day, Obama, right, and sit down and you know have conversations and develop policies and how you know Christians can interact with um, you know progressive views. Whereas with Trump, he's completely opposed and he's ideologically against. And it's just like so. Politics comes before faith. Yeah, ideology I mean, seems ideology, to come. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that that's a that's a weird thing to. Well, that's the other thing too is that as a believer, uh, every area of my life should be affected by my relationship with Jesus, and that should mean that every area of my public life and my private life. So, if I'm if I'm living in a neighborhood and there seems to be some crime my faith would say i want my neighbors to be safe my neighbors to have their possessions protected why don't i start a neighborhood watch that's somewhat of getting involved in community to help my neighbor they they would say no you can't do that that's not right i mean that's on a micro level they might say no because you're helping people you're loving your neighbor maybe that would be okay but definitely don't run for office and definitely don't you know? Try and work at the White I believe House. Believe in well, inerrancy in the Bible right. on these topics, and they give you which ones not to believe. Right. But if you don't believe in the Bible in this particular way, go ahead and run for office. Actually, can you please plead our case? We're this group. You're to our benefit. Yeah. Do it. Boom. I was just gonna say that they love Christians. Like there is something, and I hate to get relevant or something that goes on, but Chelsea Clinton came out on Twitter <laughs> and she said. Yeah. This is a perfect example. She said, as a Christian, we need abortion. Deeply religious person. Uh, as a deeply religious person right. yeah. and Christian, like, we cannot overturn Roe v. Wade. We need these women help. Like, and, uh, yeah, Matt Walsh called her a Satanist, which is true, but it was awesome. But anyway, you have, like, this thing, and she re- she actually replied back, I'm a Methodist. <laughs> to, to Matt Walsh? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I mean, that's what the thing is. Uh, they they hate, they would hate, they hate Mike Pence. He's going to electrocute and put gay people yeah. in internment My, camps. He's going to throw them off the top of roofs. He's going like to throw them off Islam. The, right? He's yeah. going to try and do th- or therapy, you know, some right. kind of. Uh, but if you get. Re- the Reverend Al Sharpton. We love him because he's a Christian and he, I mean, uh, you know, I, that's what they. Just w- as we said that, I'm thinking about the slave trade and how Turner interjected before <laughs> yeah, and said, you mean Islam? Muslims. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of this where it's like you're indicting Constantine who actually gave cover through the Byzantine, Byzantine or Byzantine Empire when the Ottoman Empire ruled. And I mean, like, the history on this is so, it's like, you, I don't know if you're on the right team. Like right. Western, no, no. Western, uh, Westernism in itself actually breeds someone who's listening might not like this the idea of liberty of the individual and the personal responsibility it actually from this inception birthed democracy it took a lot of trouble and trials to get there but the western thought process and the way that we're actually able to actually individualize things it comes through the christian world yeah world mm-hmm. judeo-christian world yeah. yeah so when it was married here right. what would you rather have had islam no what would you have rather have had like this is not the best of all outcomes whatever your argument would be right but what would you rather have or i'm going back two steps is not god in control Mm -hmm. and if he is this is by god's divine providence we don't have to approve of all the events that happened but where are we at now and they're lamenting actions that have happened well i was going to say you're you're basically saying do we believe that god can use people maybe that are unchristian for his purpose as that's was getting that's, to that, yeah. yeah and i was going to say just as he also, always has i mean they they well, quoted nebuchadnezzar yeah with daniel but um, not at the point where they were making it i know yeah. but but i mean that's an example right there or pharaoh yeah for you know he was raised up it said god actually hardened his heart it's so that they would could get out. Hopefully, the yeah. listeners see yeah. that our jabs are right. sounding like poking the worldview that they have. Like, yeah. they want the good promises, the right. ones that talk about like love, justice, and God's grace yeah. for things in general, but at the expense of the rest of truth and the particulars of functionality, like how right. do human beings operate? Yeah. And when we start talking about that, and then they say, "Oh, you can't use the Bible like that." That's right. actually immoral and it's evil. Yeah, it and is. it's oppressive. Yeah. And it's like they call us oppressive. It's like we just read the whole text. Yeah. Like I'm reading the literally what it says, and there's a context. 
Yeah. And you're telling me that I can't do that. Yeah. Because it's a living document and the living because community does not fit narrative. It yeah. doesn't fit agenda. It doesn't. And yeah. I was going to say, we're, we can probably move on after this to the next thing. But I do want to say, as I think all of us agree as P- students of history, students. Uh, all this other stuff about the U S military action, blah, 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 I expensive. Yeah. That's not true. <laughs> okay. So like, that's stuff. That's that's yeah, not yeah. how. That, and we're we're actually they're protecting so that they can have the right to put out stupid statements like this. Yeah, they're, we're protecting that right. So at, at I mean, many this, levels, we could yeah. break all this stuff down, yeah. but this is just nonsense. So all right, so we've got a we're we've been we've been on for a while here, but I I wanted to say so we have gender equality, we have racial equality, sexual we have sexual identity. and gender identity. Which one, and then economic equality. Which one of those do you guys want to go next? Um. We can't probably get, get cover all of these on this particular podcast. Well, I mean, the idea so, we could probably do two I of mean, these: the gender gender equality. I mean, the idea of what gender is, the social construction that has developed in the last several decades as yeah. to what a gender is. Well, and the and the there there what they say is they only address women. That's it. They they only address when it comes to gender. They only address women. It says women are of all experiences, and those marginalized genders, those mar- of marginalized genders as having necessary roles in teaching professional and spiritual authorities for all. And what they're saying by that is the Bible doesn't say that. Um, by, when, when they have to affirm this stuff, women of ex- all experience and marginalized genders as having necessary roles in teaching professional and spiritual authorities, they're giving the inference that the Bible does not address. Well, the generic one would be that, you know, Paul says, I would not have a woman preach, teach, so there's that one that yeah. they'll, they'll say, ah, no, right. women can do that, which the Bible actually says the women can't not teach. They can teach. But when Paul speaks in a particular matter, he's speaking about elders. They get you, that one wrong. Professional, are you talking about nuance? No, they're just wrong words. But yes, nuance <laughs> in one sense. And they say professional. Well, any Christian who reads the Bible goes to Proverbs 31. And you're talking about the most professional woman in the world and has maidens who are employed by her. Yeah, yeah. And she makes her husband's name great at the gate. Seems like there's a family involvement in this family run business and the wife is taking the lead and she's got like pearl or she's got silk or purple as the, uh, yeah. the color that identifies it. It means that she was in the wealthy, luxury wealthy. wealthy. Yeah. And the last one, spiritual Affluent. authorities of all. So again, they're hitting on this notion of, well, women don't have spiritual authority. So we affirm that they do. It's like, it's, it's just, just they're the, talking about the particulars of what was before it, yeah. said that you cannot have biblical inerrancy on areas that oppress people. Yeah. So my wife has biblical authority or uh, spiritual authorities, but they're quantified and they're applied in her gender role, yeah. which well, they, that, they, they would speak say to, you're, an, you're oppressing her. That's what they I'm would not say. the Bible is. They say you're oppressing her by not letting her be the spiritual authority in your house. But uh, I was going to say, I'm, we can probably skip through this, but I want to hit some stuff here. It says, we understand that we are in a world that disproportionately enables men to commit and reinfight and reinforce this cultural of violence. Which one was that? We affirm? No, we condemn we the condemn. last one. The where last where was that on there? The last sentence. Oh, okay, sorry. We, oh, all right, we understand. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, men to commit. And re- so this is a, this is a basically an, essentially a feminist. It's rooted in feminism and modern feminism, not, not traditional feminism radical it's okay to yeah, say radical, radical yeah radical feminism yeah but i mean right there and the, i do love they condemn com- complementarianism in all forms which is what you were saying like at our house we have roles that were designed and made by god and this is what i this is what i said last week you know in the podcast on, on episode nine i said god put a blueprint together and you're looking at the blueprint and you're saying oh it calls for this structure to be made this way that's so bigoted that's so hatred you know, so full of hatred that 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 has to be that way. I want to do it my way, and the structure could never stand because the architect and designer, who is God, knows how it should be. If we can just apply it to the blueprint, we'll find the most success. That's just general and, basic knowledge. And what they've done here with the ideology is that they. I mean, I'll say this: you guys listening podcast people uh, can go do your own research. But Johnny Money invented essentially the term gender splitting up the actual organs that correspond to your natural um, um, designation from God, physical and very much chemical. <laughs> and um, they've they've flipped it and they've taken this gender to be a functionality and um, societal um, 
roles. So they've disassociated any form of physical indications from birth, cisgender orientations or, you know, sexualities. And they've, they've distinctively placed gender as a separate issue. That's why genders can be quote unquote fluid, or you can be transgender can be whatever your mind thinks. It's more or less in the component of the mind rather than the actual uh, function of your body. It's not physiological. So that's, that's key yeah. for us as we're dissecting this, as we go forward, that they don't, they don't see two genders. They don't but see even, gender as a... But it, it, but this is my argument to that whole thing because, like, I mean, obviously we all agree in this room, but your your XY chromosomes that were that you can't change designated it. It's not It's not even the mere fact of a vagina or a penis. It's, and by the way, because I just said that, that's why we're on, we're an explicit podcast. We're Ooh, on awesome. iTunes. Yeah. I had to, but no, it's not because you have one of those two things that you're a man or a woman, right? Um, and, and that's what they're taking away. But it's actually deeper than that. Right. Those things exist because of an XY chromosome. It's, <laughs> you can't go that deep to change it. I feel it's so bad for the L, for the bee community. <laughs> the bees. They're told that there's no two genders and they're the only ones they're attracted to. Yeah. Bisexuals. Oh. Bi means two. I mean, that's something like yeah. the whole walking contradiction. So it's a contradiction, yeah. Yeah, like they don't know how to handle it, so they break it apart. It's yeah. all gender and sexuality. Well, I, I do want to touch on this because I think this is just so absolutely ridiculous that they say this. We acknowledge that a disproportionate level of such violence, they're talking about gender-based violence, violence is inflicted upon our sisters and our queer, non-binary, and transgender siblings, especially towards those individuals of color. We understand that we are in a world that disproportionately enables men to commit and reinforce this culture of violence. So, what's, again, what's their definition of violence, though? Is it that I say that you're wrong? Or that you're, well, now, I don't agree with your lifestyle. That's what they would say. They'd classify words as violence. Hate speech is violence now. Yeah. But I mean, this is this is so frustrating. It's I weak. Mean, this is, it's weak. But, so it's, I mean, this is where you see this has nothing to do with theology. Right. And they're saying, we are in a world that disproportionately- Well, hold on. If words are violence, God calls sin, sin, and right and wrong. So if that's the case, then God's pretty violent. You know, because yeah. he calls things out, right? Yeah. That's so why they they reject biblical inerrancy because you just quoted right. the Bible in context in an area where they didn't feel right. fluid enough right. to agree with you. So you're well, oppressive. There's, there's one truth, baby. Let's let's go there. Well, I, like, you were seeking to that. I was jump in here and read this. Yeah. We reject the notion of the immutability of gender. So there's the affirmation in that would be gender is fluid. So oh, it can go man. down the toilet if it wants. Apparently, that's where they're taking all genders. They yeah. can flush it. And they're doing that. Knowing that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Why did they quote that? Yeah, like, where is it? How does it even fit in? <laughs> as well as Christ's prioritization to the least of these. So they take these truisms, things that make sense in context, and they throw it back and they say, see, this is where Jesus, to their collective group, spoke about gender. It's like, no, no, he didn't. He talked about how we serve one another and how if you want to gain any type of prominence that would recognize yeah, you among men, <laughs> <laughs> this is your social justice component. Right, yeah. Like, go be socially, functionally, um, you know, functional justly right? so that when you do act, like, I can see you as God, I can give you prominence in the kingdom appropriately. But Don't he, do it out of a place of, I want this for myself. It, That's nothing to do with gender. And this is a really important thing that we... To kind of kick back to the idea of social socialist Jesus, yeah, the two Jesuses, yeah, right. When he talks about this stuff about one, serving one another, this is an individual commandment to you, to me, to you, to you. I'm pointing at these two guys and yeah. my, myself. He did not tell the government to do that, so that's a huge distinction that they're making, and they yeah. would make that case as right. Yeah, we need the government. As you, as we're reading all this stuff, the Bible, the Bible, the government, the government. At the same time, they want the government to take everything and make it equal, and that's the end goal mm -hmm. here. So it's important to see. I mean, like they, when Jesus says this stuff to you know sell, uh, you know, to give your cloak to someone who doesn't have it. He's not telling the government to take everyone else's cloak and give it to people that don't have cloaks. He's telling individual mandates, right? And that's what again this idea that you were talking about as the individual, this. You know, yeah, yeah, if you were if you were to summarize that, like uh, acting justly with your neighbor, 
proofs like right that yeah. you have a proper relationship with Christ. If you're claiming to be Christians, then your external indicators will be whether or not you're an oppressor or you're a liberator. Yeah. Like those are words that we could agree with. Like, that's true. But the forced aspect, the imperialism of love mm-hmm. that is forced on us, that you know, you, you must be doing this or I mean, you this do goes, not. This goes back like what you touched about, um, the whole meaning of life. What is uh is forced love even love? Right. Right. Yeah, I I think that the idea of volunteerism, um, because we are sinful, um, even though God requires us to do certain things, um, we, we can't we can't force somebody to prove their love by telling them that you have to meet these quotas because right. we're checking you. Actually, what's so funny and ironic about social justice, it's the absolute opposite of what Jesus says about doing your works in, you know, in a um, secret fashion. Like, don't let them be known right. to people. And the litmus test now as to whether or not you're in Christ is if you're doing just justice. Openly. Like, has this pastor spoken publicly about this issue? Right. Yeah. And it's a, there's a pressure there. There's a legitimate pressure. Yeah. That they put, you know, but on. from the world. Yeah, it's from the world for yeah. sure. It's definitely not, you know, from the word. But um, so let's let's move on. So the the next one is racial equality. I don't know if we really need to spend a lot of time on that. We've it's it's something that's been, you know, we've talked about it before, you know, as a group, and you know, I. But yeah, I mean, I, I kind of we're running out of time. I want to go down to to sexuality and gender identity, and then I want to close with just some 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 ways that we can really balance this out the way it needs to be balanced for, for, for the listeners that are, that are listening to us. But it says we affirm sexuality and gender identity. It says we affirm the beauty in our diverse gender and sexuality minority identities. So there, that statement, that sentence alone, okay. Uh, we recognize the image of the divine reflected by each of our LGBTQIA plus symbol sibling, siblings who are loved unconditionally as they are. Okay, so just the gospel alone, you know, you come as you are, but you leave completely new. I mean, John chapter 3 talks about being born again, and something di- something is given new life, and there's an old that's left behind, and there's a new that's born in, and Paul says that there's an incorruptible seed that's deposited within you that will eventually you know, grow out, and we'll, we'll see the culmination of that seed when we get to heaven. And so... How, when we talk about someone that's making a lifestyle choice, okay, they are making a lifestyle choice, and it's contrary to the revealed word of God. And I, I know, I know, you could use you're like, yeah, but that's not what they believe. I get that, but the reality of that whole thing is that you can't legitimately, you can't legitimately make a statement like that. That they love, he, they're loved unconditionally. That therefore they must remain as right. they are that's that's the problem that's and the problem they're not I, have. I mean these guys are i mean they're showing their cards i keep saying that they're not orthodox christians i mean i can't not say that they're just not christians when you affirm <laughs> right, this type christians. of um statement by saying gender is fluid to the point that you want these people to remain in an opposing position and posturation against their creator who wants them to submit mm-hmm. now again we can read further that they actually they want them to flourish in these identities. So they want them to go off and to have these relationships. They want that because they believe that it's, it's identified through experience and through nature. And they affirm that nowhere in this are you seeing that they talk about um, original sin through Adam, you know, how we have right. imputed yeah. sin that corrupts us, that we're broken. Yeah. And they never address the fact there's a key question is that did God create us un, you know, unable to um, obey his law? The answer is no. God created this whole and perfect in Adam, but then in Adam all has fallen. All are now broken. Right. So they don't have an answer. They just basically affirm the fallen state. Right. So they're basically saying, um, if you're married, even to, you know, even if you're gay married to another guy, and you're cheating, and you're in a committed relationship, and you're cheating, you should not go up to that person and say, "Hey, maybe you should stop cheating on your spouse." They would say, "Hey, just just let him do it. Let him flourish. He wants to have fifteen partners and well, still they, be married." They actually say here it says in one of their affirmations it says, uh, "Well, two things." It says, yeah, I saw that. "We affirm the need to repent 
for the behavior of the church, yep. which has caused and continues to cause harm to the L- LGBTQIA plus symbol community. So they're they're laying the blame on the church, not on not on the not at the offender that offends God's word, the one who's in the sinful condition in the sinful state, who's in great need to repent to find true community with God and oneness and forgiveness and freedom, right? Not not that person. It's the church who is who is which we would be labeled as in that camp because we're actually saying this is wrong or this behavior is ungodly. We're, they're the ones that need to be repent from that. And so they're elevating someone's sexual identity above God's word. And this goes to the next statement where it says, we affirm, <laughs> this is just crazy to me. It says, we affirm, uh, oh shoot, where'd it go? Oh, we affirm uh, the uh, autonomy of our LGBTQI plus symbol, simply si- siblings to enter into marriage as they see fit blessed by God. So it's as they see fit, not as not as what God's revealed, but as they see fit. So now it's like the the departure isn't even it's like clear. There's not even a question there. Yeah. And so you're just seeing it like evident, evident, evident. Now I understand this is a fringe more more of a fringe group, but as I said in the opening of this podcast, because they're progressive Asian Americans, because they're Asian they they're homosexuals they're affirming of these things they are going to they are going to gain a voice because they have more intersections there to say we are more victimized than this traditional white middle class evangelical church group. I was going to say it's important that we we're going <laughs> to I don't know if you were going to say this at the end Cody but these guys are not I mean these guys are seen as radical even within liberals this is there's some of this they're going stuff. a little too far they're going a little too far but this like Tim Keller wouldn't be able to affirm this stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I really hope um, not. But at the same time, this is not at all uh crazy to think that uh I mean this is this is mainstream outside of Christian belief. So this is not crazy stuff. This is I mean it's not Christian, but this is not stuff that you will not encounter as a Christian living in the world. Yeah. I mean, some of this stuff I'm looking at reading it right now for like the second time with more serious eyes. You already see this in the Episcopal Church, in the Methodist Church. Well, that's why they're dying. Yeah, the Episcopal Church is turning into bars and they're shutting down. And there's a there's a lot of this in here. Um, Turner was speaking about the, the minority aspect and how they can speak and people will listen. And I think this is this is exactly I may have said it before. This is exactly I think what was um, anticipated by those that drafted the social um, social gospel social justice in the gospel statement yeah. is that they were like all right fine you are you some of you mainline evangelical preachers are using these terminologies you're using them every single time you're preaching on a particular topic do you even know what you're advocating for totally because social justice doesn't just hit on racial reconciliation right. it's a buzzword it doesn't just hit on it's a spectrum yeah, it's, and it's a yeah. huge spectrum. So when you start saying that and using those uh, those terms, you you attract these types of individuals who have no identity in Christ at all, and their identity is plainly revealed here in their fallen nature. And they're basically saying, "We're Christians too. We're here for this time to speak loudly against." And you're saying it, the church. I mean, they're yeah. speaking against the church, which is a, the establishment, mm-hmm. the system, which yep. is something for the listener to. to pay attention is like they're isolating systems yeah power structures and the church and they're against these huge groups that are oppressive unless that huge group is in agreement with them Mm -hmm. and then they're fine with it so i just want to read this last part from the sexuality and gender identity because again this is just we reject the notion that gender and sexual minorities should aspire to being cisgender and heterosexual we reject mandatory celibacy and conversion therapy as ineffective psychologically and physically harmful practices with potentially fatal results. I think that's really interesting because I, I mean, just that's a whole thing, but it's interesting how they said we reject mandatory celibacy and conversion therapy as potentially fatal results. 
I don't think that's unintentional that they put that as. No, of course not. The, uh, so they're saying, yeah. I mean, they're equating the two. We're, they're saying mandatory celibacy. So that's, I guess we could say this, like, that the Christian, I mean, the, a conservative thing when you're talking about the choice of a lifestyle, not the gender identity, is that if there is someone struggling with homosexual thoughts or temptations or something like that, one of the things that people, I guess that's in the church, or and it's the same thing with heterosexual temptations or whatever like that because i guess as guys even if you're in it even if you're married or anything like that when jesus said you know you lust with your eyes you're committed adultery in your heart and stuff like that um and i mean not to go on that too much but um he i mean guys in a committed relationship will look at other women lustfully i mean that's a i I don't want to say a normal and i think it's a normal thing that a the human drive is to reproduce as much as possible, you know, at a very base animal level. Um, so there are things that <laughs> I don't want to say it's like a struggle, but heterosexual guys, especially in this. Well, it's hy- just the flesh. It's right. the flesh, the appetites of the flesh. But we are told right? we're, we're told to suppress it. I mean, not in not in a not in a rude way. They're just saying like you, you get what I'm saying? Like as a guy, even if you're married and you see someone that's hot, mm-hmm. like a hot woman, your brain might go, the flesh will go, oh, you should uh, Get pursue that. Yeah. yeah. And so, or with pornography or stuff like mm-hmm. this. Um, so with the gay, you know, we heterosexuals suppress a lot of stuff as well. And so one of the things that like a, a typical Christian response, which is biblical, is to say someone that's struggling with this stuff, maybe, maybe in a rare case, you know, the Bible does talk about c- celibacy for life. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, there's a difference between acting out like what they want is for a gay person to say, I will, I will always be gay and I don't want to, God did not create me to be alone. And if this is, if this is the only way celibacy can't happen because Mm -hmm. I have to be sexual, I'm a a free sexual, you know, butterfly and I need to fly and, you know, do all this stuff. Yeah, And And they've created these categories, gender, totally created that one. They've restructured the definition of sexuality. So now they've given themselves more fluidity. That's a right. word. The, they create another category called sexual minorities because they've splintered sexuality off into a thousand pieces. So now they have cisgender, they created that one, and the homos- heterosexual um, uh, realities that we that we all walk into. The temptation component where they basically have denied throughout the whole thing is that when it goes to mandatory celibacy, that could come from God. And, you know, what's their problem? They deny the specifics when it comes, especially biblical specifics, when it comes to areas of people who feel oppressed. So if this person's a sexual minority, they don't assign themselves back to their cisgender, they're not a heterosexual, they have every right, affirmed by this group, to rebel against God and to find their identity in their fallen state and to, as they see fit, act out in it. Act out in it. And they actually, I think one step further... If they're not able to act out into it, right. and if society is denying them that right, conversion therapy or celibacy, <laughs> then we blame society and the church for the death rates that happen, the suicide. Right, right. That that's happens what they're, in the they're church. alluding to the suicide. Yep. Even yep. though the suicide rate amongst homosexuals outside of any conversion therapy or, or any type of of you know um, anyone in their life uh, is much higher. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but the, the suicide rate on homosexual lifestyle is much higher um, because of what comes with it. And they would say, well, that's because of oppression. And, you know, but we would say there's a diff, uh, it's a, there's a deeper issue going on there. Well, I mean, but I want to just say something, you know, so if there's a believer that's listening to this right now, someone who's a Christian and they struggle with same sex attraction or they have, they, they're not sure how to handle this. The answer is not to go run, jump into this type of what they're saying, because what you're experiencing with that, that tear in your, you know, the, the pool of, is it right or wrong is actually identified in Romans chapter seven with the apostle Paul, because he, he claims that, that there, he says, I keep doing things I don't want to do. I do what I don't want to do. And, uh, and he says, and, and he says, there's literally a war inside of me. Mm-hmm. And it's the law of sin, and this, that's the law of God. And he says that I then myself, in my mind, am a slave to the God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave 
to the law of sin. This is the dilemma of every believer. Mm -hmm. We're going to have tendencies, weaknesses, and God gives us an answer. The answer is in Romans chapter 8, which is life through the Spirit. You walk in the power of God's Holy Spirit. So now you appeal to a greater power. Instead of giving in, you appeal to a greater power and you walk in that freedom. It doesn't guarantee that every moment will be free. Right. So when I'm when I'm as a heterosexual, when I see a when I see a woman, instead of giving into that temptation to lust, I exercise self control, which is a gift from God through the Holy Spirit. I have to do that through God's Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And what they're simply asserting here is that they're they're reducing the power of God's Holy Spirit in a in a converted believer to non existence, and that you must remain in the place that you are and that you can live how you want, and that your desires and your plans are greater than God's word because God's word has been handed down through sinful men who changed it for their benefit. And all of that is a ruse, and it's a lie, and it's an agenda, and it, it is satanic. It is satanic in nature. And if you want to talk about faith and deeds, we want to talk about what that means because they're talking about your true testament to being a Christian is when you fight for injustices, uh, the James, which is the commentary on faith and deeds in the New Testament, he says that we shouldn't show favoritism. There is clear favoritism mm -hmm. in these documents uh, against people of mine and yours, heterosexual, male, you know, cisgendered, whatever you want to, yeah, Christians, against that lifestyle, and all of that is a choice as well. So when you talk about it, he doesn't he says don't show favoritism and then the other side about it is when he talks about the deeds that you do he says those deeds are the result of your faith mm -hmm. they're not the other way around it doesn't gain you access to heaven it's because you have access to heaven you now can and will do those deeds and so there's a lot of backwards thinking and a lot of upside down and a lot of just error in what they're doing and denial of truth and and I just want to say this, if you're listening to this and you are finding yourself, if you're listening to this because it came by you and you're like, and someone, someone said, you listen to these Christian dudes and how wrong they are, I want to urge you to repent of what you are believing right now because there is a righteous and holy God who loves you and wants you to be with him. And he does not want you to live apart from him, but your sinful behavior and your denial of his truth is going to prohibit you from having access to him. And so if you simply will repent and believe the truth, you will gain access to him by the power of regeneration of his Holy Spirit in faith. It's an act of faith, and you will find freedom for the first time in your life possibly by doing that act. But I would say do not remain in the condition you are because that is an eternal state of separation from God, and that means you'll move from this life into eternal separation in eternity apart from him, and that is not a place you want to be. And I would say heed the conviction over your heart right now turn from that sin, repent to God, ask for forgiveness, and find freedom in Christ. That is the only place you're going to find wholeness and freedom and true justice that you desire. It'll be in Christ Jesus. And that's all I'm going to say about that. No, I, I'd agree Sorry. on 100%. It's a, probably a good place to wind this whole thing down. Stephen has something he wants to say. Uh, maybe close this out. Um, but the, the idea that this, this whole document is in response to a document that pretty much affirms everything you said, wants to have a biblical worldview on what sin is, identifying it for the cult, for the preacher, for the culture, so that when we speak to issues that are actually uh, relevant in our time, that we're, we're able to place a biblical response to it and give, um, give, give the culture a chance to, to receive the gospel. And what this does is it just cuts off the access point right, right at the very beginning to enter into the gospel is it basically says, you're not a sinner. You don't have any sin to worry about. Whatever you're doing is fine, and God's blessing it. We're here to protect you and to save right, you. Right, yeah. yeah. Remain where you are. Yeah. And that, the, it's all good. You're a frog in boiling water, that, you know, water that's a pot of water that's getting mm -hmm. hotter. But remain where you are. And that's a scare. For me, reading this, and I go to the primary, primary sources all the time, reading these guys, and I'm like, oh, there's a clear motive. Yeah. But if I don't know they're... If, if I, if, if I don't know what they're trying to say, I can it's easily dismiss them. It's like I, I hear what they're trying to say. They're, they're very broken. Mm -hmm. And we need to, as, as Christians, as believers, speak to the brokenness that they're trying to mend by saying, don't talk to us. Don't tell us about our faults and our failures. Um, and if we as the church have, have overlooked them, have um, made them feel uncomfortable, 
marginalize them. Uh, that's a that's a past generation's sin that we don't want to repeat. And so I think with this conversation, it's allowing us now to openly talk about homosexuality. It's allowing us to talk about what gender looks like now to a new generation that's given themselves a new definition. And, um, you know, we want to be loving towards them, but we're also not going to be um, complacent about this issue because they're gearing up, um, uh, seems like an ideology that's just unfit even for their worldview. It's going to crumble. It's going to fall. And they end on basically saying that we're going to die if we don't affirm our own positions. And it's going to be the Christian's fault because they weren't allowing us to flourish. And they're they're basically, in my opinion, wanting to um, destroy the other ideologies. And that would be Christianity. They want it gone. They, yeah. their, their, their mission is that it needs to go away. And that's what I, I read from this. I, I totally agree with what Turner said about those that listen and um, you know the gospel call is there for you. But this statement alone just cuts off the access point to repentance. And so I would uh, tell you to read it, but don't believe in what they're trying to tell you or sell you in this little Or document. just read your Bible and compare it. Yeah. Like, yeah, re- like legitimately read your Bible and compare it to what they're saying. Um, you know, so. Yeah, I was going to say that it, that is all good stuff. And I know that we probably mean more so uh, poked fun at some of this stuff, um, but it is serious. And um, kind of on a serious term uh, note, when, when Turner was talking um, before he started bringing that fire, uh, yeah. Um <laughs> that it, there it, it's a, it's a lie from Satan that if you're born with a certain sin and I'm not picking on anything in particular that you will die with that afflicted in the same manner that you are currently afflicted with. Um say it's drug addiction or something like that and you're like I'm going to die a drug addict and there's no hope for me. Um or you're born, uh, you know, you think you're with, struggling with homosexual attraction or something like that. Um, you're basically saying, um, God cannot overcome this in my life. And that, that's that's a very scary thing. Um, and that's absolutely not true. Yeah. Um, so, you know, God does have, I mean, we're sitting, God three, does amazing stuff. All three of it this, at this table, right. that's it. we all had addictions that God miraculously has delivered us through yes, his it. power. And, and some of us struggled harder. Like I had, I had the miraculous deliverance of drugs where once I was born again, they just, they, they, it was completely loosened from me. And, and, you know, not everybody gets that road. Some people, you know, they have to fight through it, you know, but God's so good. Mm-hmm. And yeah. he's a deliverer. Yeah, I was just gonna say that it, it's not hopeless. Sorry. Like if right. you're if you're born with this, there is hope. I mean, yeah. that's the Amen. thing. If God can make the if God can make the world, I think He can He can make the complex. I mean, when you just think of it as a, a high level down, if God if God can create this, He can help you. Yeah, I mean, that's not it's not difficult. I mean, it wouldn't be difficult for God. Right. Right. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing is, nothing is impossible. Right. Yeah. So. Ben, this has been an awesome podcast, guys. It's a good series, part one. You know, go back and listen to part one. If you haven't listened to it, it'll help you to understand what, why we're so strong on part two. But, man, I just uh, I just think uh, this has been great. It's been awesome. For you, listener, we thank you for sticking in for all this time. And we know that uh, if you continue to listen, we will be so grateful because, <laughs> and if you feel like you want to share with somebody, we're even more grateful. <laughs> but uh, thanks for listening. We will catch you guys next time. This is All Out War. See ya. Thanks for listening to the All Out War podcast today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to know more, you can visit us on the web at alloutwar.us or you can find us on Twitter at All Out Warcast. Hey, thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time.